Welcome to Virgo Potens. I invite you to give this video a like and to subscribe to my channel. YouTube has introduced a great feature called Super Thanks. If you enjoy this video, you can support my work or say thank you by clicking on the Super Thanks icon. It's similar to offering support through a Super Chat. Part 5 of The Dolorous Passion by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich Chapter 27 Ecce Homo The cruel executioners then reconducted our Lord to Pilate's palace, with the scarlet cloak still thrown over his shoulders, the crown of thorns on his head, and the reed in his fettered hands. He was perfectly unrecognizable, his eyes, mouth, and beard being covered with blood, his body but one wound, and his back bowed down as that of an aged man, while every limb trembled as he walked. When Pilate saw him standing at the entrance of his tribunal, even he, hard-hearted as he usually was, started and shuddered with horror and compassion, whilst the barbarous priests and the populace, far from being moved to pity, continued their insults and mockery. When Jesus had ascended the stairs, Pilate came forward. The trumpet was sounded to announce that the governor was about to speak, and he addressed the chief priests and the bystanders in the following words. Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no cause in him. The archers then led Jesus up to Pilate, that the people might again feast their cruel eyes on him, in that state of degradation to which he was reduced. Terrible and heart-rending, indeed, was the spectacle he presented, and an exclamation of horror burst from the multitude, followed by a dead silence when he, with difficulty, raised his wounded head, crowned as it was with thorns, and cast his exhausted glance on the excited throng. Pilate exclaimed as he pointed him out to the people, Ecce homo, behold the man! The hatred of the high priests and their followers was, if possible, increased at the sight of Jesus, and they cried out, Put him to death! Crucify him! Are you not content? said Pilate, the punishment he has received is, beyond question, sufficient to deprive him of all desire of making himself king. But they cried out the more, and the multitude joined in the cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate then sounded the trumpet to demand silence, and said, Take you him and crucify him, for I find no cause in him. We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, replied the priests because he made himself the Son of God. These words, he made himself the Son of God, revived the fears of Pilate. He took Jesus into another room and asked him, Whence art thou? But Jesus made no answer. Speakest thou not to me? said Pilate. Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Thou shouldst not have any power against me, replied Jesus, unless it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. The undecided, weak conduct of Pilate filled Claudia Proclus with anxiety. She again sent him the pledge to remind him of his promise, but he only returned a vague, superstitious answer, importing that he should leave the decision of the case to the gods. The enemies of Jesus, the high priests and the Pharisees, having heard of the efforts which were being made by Claudia to save him, caused a report to be spread among the people, that the partisans of our Lord had seduced her, that he would be released, and then join the Romans and bring about the destruction of Jerusalem and the extermination of Jews. Pilate was in such a state of indecision and uncertainty as to be perfectly beside himself, he did not know what step to take next, and again addressed himself to the enemies of Jesus, declaring that he found no crime in him, but they demanded his death still more clamorously. He then remembered the contradictory accusations which had been brought against Jesus, the mysterious dreams of his wife, and the unaccountable impression which the words of Jesus had made on himself and therefore determined to question him again in order to thus obtain some information, 
which might enlighten him as to the course he ought to pursue. He therefore returned to the praetorium, went alone into a room, and sent for our Savior. He glanced at the mangled and bleeding form before him, and exclaimed inwardly, Is it possible that he can be God? Then he turned to Jesus, and adjured him to tell him if he was God, if he was that king who had been promised to the Jews, where his kingdom was, and to what class of gods he belonged. I can only give the sense of the words of Jesus, but they were solemn and severe. He told him that his kingdom was not of this world, and he likewise spoke strongly of the many hidden crimes with which the conscience of Pilate was defiled, warned him of the dreadful fate which would be his if he did not repent, and finally declared that he himself, the Son of Man, would come at the last day to pronounce a just judgment upon him. Pilate was half frightened and half angry at the words of Jesus. He returned to the balcony and again declared that he would release Jesus. But they cried out, If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's friend. For whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Others said that they would accuse him to the emperor of having disturbed their festival, that he must make up his mind at once, because they were obliged to be in the temple by ten o'clock at night. The cry, Crucify him! Crucify him! resounded on all sides. It re-echoed even from the flat roofs of the houses near the forum, where many persons were assembled. Pilate saw that all his efforts were vain, that he could make no impression on the infuriated mob. Their yells and imprecations were deafening, and he began to fear an insurrection. Therefore he took water and washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. A frightful and unanimous cry then came from the dense multitude, who were assembled from all parts of Palestine. His blood be upon us and upon our children. Chapter 29 Jesus Condemned to be Crucified Pilate, who did not desire to know the truth, but was solely anxious to get out of the difficulty without harm to himself, became more undecided than ever. His conscience whispered, Jesus is innocent. His wife said, He is holy. His superstitious feelings made him fear that Jesus was the enemy of his gods, and his cowardice filled him with dread lest Jesus, if he was a god, should wreck his vengeance upon his judge. He was both irritated and alarmed at the last words of Jesus, and he made another attempt for his release. But the Jews instantly threatened to lay an accusation against him before the emperor. This menace terrified him, and he determined to accede to their wishes, although firmly convinced in his own mind of the innocence of Jesus, and perfectly conscious that by pronouncing sentence of death upon him, he should violate every law of justice, besides breaking the promise he had made to his wife in the morning. Thus did he sacrifice Jesus to the enmity of the Jews, and endeavor to stifle remorse by washing his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. Vainly dost thou pronounce these words, O Pilate, for his blood is on thy head likewise. Thou canst not wash his blood from thy soul, as thou dost from thy hands. Those fearful words, his blood be upon us and upon our children, had scarcely ceased to resound when Pilate commenced his preparations for passing sentence. He called for the dress which he wore on state occasions, put a species of diadem set in precious stones on his head, changed his mantle, and caused a staff to be carried before him. He was surrounded with soldiers, preceded by officers belonging to the tribunal, and followed by scribes, who carried rolls of parchments and books used for inscribing names and dates. One man walked in front who carried the trumpet. The procession marched in this order from Pilate's palace to the Forum, where an elevated seat used on these particular occasions was placed opposite to the pillar where Jesus was scourged. This tribunal was called Gabbatha. It was a kind of round terrace, ascended by means of staircases. On the top was a seat for Pilate, and behind this seat a bench for those in minor offices while a number of soldiers were stationed round the terrace and upon the staircases. 
Many of the Pharisees had left the palace and were gone to the temple, so that Anas, Caiaphas, and twenty-eight priests alone followed the Roman governor on to the forum, and the two thieves were taken there at the time that Pilate presented our Savior to the people, saying, Ecce Homo. Our Lord was still clothed in his purple garment, his crown of thorns upon his head, and his hands manacled, when the archers brought him up to the tribunal and placed him between the two malefactors. As soon as Pilate was seated, he again addressed the enemies of Jesus in these words, Behold your king! But the cries of, Crucify him! Crucify him! resounded on all sides. Shall I crucify your king? said Pilate. We have no king but Caesar, responded the high priests. Pilate found it was utterly hopeless to say anything more, and therefore commenced his preparations for passing sentence. The two thieves had received their sentence of crucifixion some time before, but the high priests had obtained a respite for them, in order that our Lord might suffer the additional ignominy of being executed with two criminals of the most infamous description. The crosses of the two thieves were by their sides. That intended for our Lord was not brought, because he was not as yet sentenced to death. The Blessed Virgin, who had retired to some distance after the scourging of Jesus, again approached to hear the sentence of death pronounced upon her Son and her God. Jesus stood in the midst of the archers, at the foot of the staircase leading up to the tribunal. The trumpet was sounded to demand silence, and then the cowardly, the base judge, in a tremulous, undecided voice, pronounced the sentence of death on the just man. The sight of the cowardice and duplicity of this despicable being, who was nevertheless puffed up with pride at his important position, almost overcame me, and the ferocious joy of the executioners, the triumphant countenances of the high priests, added to the deplorable condition to which our loving Savior was reduced, and the agonizing grief of his beloved mother still further increased my pain. I looked up again and saw the cruel Jews almost devouring their victim with their eyes, the soldiers standing coldly by, and multitudes of horrible demons passing to and fro and mixing in the crowd. I felt that I ought to have been in the place of Jesus, my beloved spouse, for the sentence would not then have been unjust. But I was so overcome with anguish, and my sufferings were so intense, that I cannot exactly remember all that I did see. However, I will relate all as nearly as I can. After a long preamble, which was composed principally of the most pompous and exaggerated eulogy of the Emperor Tiberius, Pilate spoke of the accusations which had been brought against Jesus by the high priests. He said that they had condemned him to death for having disturbed the public peace and broken their laws by calling himself the Son of God and King of the Jews and that the people had unanimously demanded that their decree should be carried out. Notwithstanding his oft-repeated conviction of the innocence of Jesus, this mean and worthless judge was not ashamed of saying that he likewise considered their decision a just one, and that he should therefore pronounce sentence, which he did in these words, I condemn Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, to be crucified and he ordered the executioners to bring the cross. I think I remember likewise that he took a long stick in his hands, broke it, and threw the fragments at the feet of Jesus. On hearing these words of Pilate, the mother of Jesus became for a few moments totally unconscious, for she was now certain that her beloved son must die the most ignominious and the most painful of all deaths. John and the holy women carried her away to prevent the heartless beings who surrounded them from adding crime to crime by jeering at her grief. But no sooner did she revive a little than she begged to be taken again to each spot which had been sanctified by the sufferings of her son in order to bedew them with her tears. And thus did the mother of our Lord, in the name of the church, take possession of those holy places." Pilate then wrote down the sentence, and those who stood behind him copied it out three times. The words which he wrote were quite different from those he had pronounced. 
I could see plainly that his mind was dreadfully agitated. An angel of wrath appeared to guide his hand. The substance of the written sentence was this. I have been compelled for fear of an insurrection to yield to the wishes of the high priests, the Sanhedrin, and the people, who tumultuously demanded the death of Jesus of Nazareth, whom they accused of having disturbed the public peace, and also having blasphemed and broken their laws. I have given him up to them to be crucified, although their accusations appeared to be groundless. I have done so for fear of their alleging to the emperor that I encourage insurrections and cause dissatisfaction among the Jews by denying them the rights of justice. He then wrote the inscription for the cross, while his clerks copied out the sentence several times, that these copies might be sent to distant parts of the country. The high priests were extremely dissatisfied at the words of the sentence, which they said were not true, and they clamorously surrounded the tribunal to endeavor to persuade him to alter the inscription, and not to put king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate was vexed and answered impatiently, What I have written, I have written. They were likewise anxious that the cross of our Lord should not be higher than those of the two thieves, but it was necessary for it to be so, because there would otherwise not have been sufficient place for Pilate's inscription. They therefore endeavored to persuade him not to have this obnoxious inscription put up at all. But Pilate was determined, and their words made no impression upon him. The cross was therefore obliged to be lengthened by a fresh bit of wood. Consequently, the form of the cross was peculiar. The two arms stood out like the branches of a tree growing from the stem, and the shape was very much like that of the letter Y, with the lower part lengthened so as to rise between the arms, which had been put on separately, and were thinner than the body of the cross. A piece of wood was likewise nailed at the bottom of the cross for the feet to rest upon. During the time that Pilate was pronouncing the iniquitous sentence, I saw his wife, Claudia Proclus, sent him back the pledge which he had given her, and in the evening she left his palace and joined the friends of our Lord, who concealed her in a subterraneous vault in the house of Lazarus at Jerusalem. Later in the same day, I likewise saw a friend of our Lord engrave the words Eudix and Eustus and the name of Claudia Proclus on a green-looking stone, which was behind the terrace called Gabatha. This stone is still to be found in the foundations of a church or house at Jerusalem, which stands on the spot formerly called Gabatha. Claudia Proclus became a Christian, followed St. Paul, and became his particular friend. No sooner had Pilate pronounced sentence than Jesus was given up into the hands of the archers, and the clothes which he had taken off in the court of Caiaphas were brought for him to put on again. I think some charitable persons had washed them, for they looked clean. The ruffians who surrounded Jesus untied his hands for his dress to be changed, and roughly dragged off the scarlet mantle with which they had clothed him in mockery, thereby reopening all his wounds. He put on his own linen undergarment with trembling hands, and they threw his scapular over his shoulders. As the crown of thorns was too large and prevented the seamless robe which his mother had made for him from going over his head, they pulled it off violently, heedless of the pain thus inflicted upon him. His white woolen dress was next thrown over his shoulders, and then his wide belt and cloak. After this, they again tied round his waist a ring covered with sharp iron points, and to it they fastened the cords by which he was led, doing all with their usual brutal cruelty. The two thieves were standing, one on the right and the other on the left of Jesus, with their hands tied in a chain round their necks. They were covered with black and livid marks, the effects of the scourging of the previous day. The demeanor of the one who was afterwards converted was quiet and peaceable, while that of the other, on the contrary, was rough and insolent, and he joined the archers in abusing and insulting Jesus, who looked upon his two companions with love and compassion, and offered up his sufferings for their salvation. 
the archers gathered together all the implements necessary for the crucifixions and prepared everything for the terrible and painful journey to Calvary. Anas and Caiaphas at last left off disputing with Pilate and angrily retired, taking with them the sheets of parchment on which the sentence was written. They went away in haste, fearing that they should get to the temple too late for the paschal sacrifice. Thus did the high priests, unknowingly to themselves, leave the true paschal lamb. They went to a temple made of stone to immolate and to sacrifice the lamb which was but a symbol, and they left the true paschal lamb, who was being led to the altar of the cross by the cruel executioners. They were most careful not to contract exterior defilement, while their souls were completely defiled by anger, hatred, and envy. They had said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And by these words they had performed the ceremony, and had placed the hand of the sacrificer upon the head of the victim. Thus were the two paths formed, the one leading to the altar belonging to the Jewish law, the other leading to the altar of grace. Pilate, that proud and irresolute pagan, that slave of the world, who trembled in the presence of the true God, and yet adored his false gods, took a middle path and returned to his palace. The iniquitous sentence was given at about ten in the morning. Chapter 30 The Carriage of the Cross When Pilate left the tribunal, a portion of the soldiers followed him and were drawn up in files before the palace, a few accompanying the criminals. Eight and twenty armed Pharisees came to the forum on horseback in order to accompany Jesus to the place of execution, and among these were the six enemies of Jesus who had assisted in arresting him in the Garden of Olives. The archers led Jesus into the middle of the court. The slaves threw down the cross at his feet, and the two arms were forthwith tied onto the centerpiece. Jesus knelt down by its side and circled it with his sacred arms and kissed it three times, addressing at the same time a most touching prayer of thanksgiving to his heavenly Father for that work of redemption which he had begun. It was the custom among pagans for the priest to embrace a new altar, and Jesus in like manner embraced his cross, that august altar on which the bloody and expiatory sacrifice was about to be offered. The archer soon made him rise, and then kneel down again, and almost without any assistance, placed the heavy cross on his right shoulder, supporting its great weight with his right hand. I saw angels come to his assistance, otherwise he would have been unable even to raise it from the ground. Whilst he was on his knees and still praying, the executioners put the arms of the crosses, which were a little curved and not as of yet fastened to the centerpieces on the backs of the two thieves, and tied their hands tightly to them. The middle parts of the crosses were carried by slaves, as the transverse pieces were not to be fastened to them until just before the time of execution. The trumpet sounded to announce the departure of Pilate's horsemen, and one of the Pharisees belonging to the escort came up to Jesus, who was still kneeling, and said, Rise, we have had a sufficiency of thy fine speeches. Rise and set off. They pulled him up roughly, for he was totally unable to rise without assistance, and he then felt upon his shoulders the weight of that cross, which we must carry after him, according to his true and holy command to follow him. Thus began that triumphant march of the King of Kings, a march so ignominious on earth and so glorious in heaven. By means of ropes, which the executioners had fastened to the foot of the cross, two archers supported it to prevent its getting entangled in anything, and four other soldiers took hold of the ropes, which they had fastened to Jesus underneath his clothes. The sight of our dear Lord trembling beneath his burden reminded me forcibly of Isaac, when he carried the wood destined for his own sacrifice up the mountain. The trumpet of Pilate was sounded as the signal for departure, 
for he himself intended to go to Calvary at the head of a detachment of soldiers to prevent the possibility of an insurrection. He was on horseback, in armor, surrounded by officers and a body of cavalry, and followed by about 300 of the infantry, who came from the frontiers of Italy and Switzerland. The procession was headed by a trumpeter, who sounded his trumpet at every corner and proclaimed the sentence. A number of women and children walked behind the procession with ropes, nails, wedges, and baskets filled with different articles. In their hands, others, who were stronger, carried poles, ladders, and the centerpieces of the crosses of the two thieves, and some of the Pharisees followed on horseback. A boy, who had charge of the inscription which Pilate had written for the cross, likewise carried the crown of thorns, which had been taken off the head of Jesus, at the end of a long stick, but he did not appear to be wicked and hard-hearted, like the rest. Next, I beheld our blessed Savior and Redeemer, as his bare feet, swollen and bleeding, his back bent as though he were about to sink under the heavy weight of the cross, and his whole body covered with wounds and blood. He appeared to be half fainting from exhaustion, having had neither refreshment nor sleep since the supper of the previous night, weak from loss of blood and parched with thirst produced by fever and pain. He supported the cross on his right shoulder with his right hand. The left hung almost powerless at his side, but he endeavored now and then to hold up his long garment to prevent his bleeding feet from getting entangled in it. The four archers who held the cords which were fastened round his waist walked at some distance from him. The two in front pulled him on, and the two behind dragged him back, so that he could not get on at all without the greatest difficulty. His hands were cut by the cords with which they had been bound, his face bloody and disfigured, his hair and beard saturated with blood. The weight of the cross and of his chains combined to press and make the woolen dress cleave to his wounds and reopen them. Derisive and heartless words alone were addressed to him, but he continued to pray for his persecutors, and his countenance bore an expression of combined love and resignation. Many soldiers under arms walked by the side of the procession, and after Jesus came to the two thieves, who were likewise led, the arms of their crosses, separate from the middle, being placed upon their backs and their hands tied tightly to the two ends. They were clothed in large aprons with a sort of sleeveless scapular, which covered the upper part of their bodies, and they had straw caps upon their heads. The good thief was calm, but the other was, on the contrary, furious, and never ceased cursing and swearing. The rear of the procession was brought up by the remainder of the Pharisees on horseback, who rode to and fro to keep order. Pilate and his couriers were at a certain distance behind. He was in the midst of his officers clad in armor, preceded by a squadron of cavalry, and followed by three hundred foot soldiers. He crossed the forum and then entered one of the principal streets, for he was marching through the town in order to prevent any insurrection among the people. Jesus was conducted by a narrow back street that the procession might not inconvenience the persons who were going to the temple, and likewise in order that Pilate and his band might have the whole principal street entirely to themselves. The crowd had dispersed and started in different directions almost immediately, after the reading of the sentence. And the greatest part of the Jews either returned to their own houses or to the temple to hasten their preparations for sacrificing the Paschal Lamb. But a certain number were still hurrying on in disorder to see the melancholy procession pass. The Roman soldiers prevented all persons from joining the procession. Therefore, the most curious were obliged to go round back streets or to quicken their steps so as to reach Calvary before Jesus. The street through which they led Jesus was both narrow and dirty. He suffered much in passing through it, because the archers were close and harassed him. Persons stood on the roofs of houses and at the windows, and insulted him with opprobrious language. The slaves who were working in the streets threw filth and mud at him. Even the children, incited by his enemies, had filled their pinafores with sharp stones, which they threw down before their doors as he passed, that he might be obliged to walk over them.
Chapter 31, The First Fall of Jesus The street of which we have just spoken, after turning a little to the left, became rather steep, as also wider, a subterranean aqueduct proceeding from Mount Sion passed under it, and in its vicinity was a hollow which was often filled with water and mud after rain, and a large stone was placed in its center to enable persons to pass over it more easily. When Jesus reached this spot, his strength was perfectly exhausted. He was quite unable to move, and as the archers dragged and pushed him without showing the slightest compassion, he fell quite down against the stone, and the cross fell by his side. The cruel executioners were obliged to stop. They abused and struck him unmercifully, but the whole procession came to a standstill, which caused a degree of confusion. Vainly did he hold out his hand for someone to assist him to rise. Ah, he exclaimed, all will soon be over. And he prayed for his enemies. Lift him up, said the Pharisees, otherwise he will die in our hands. There were many women and children following the procession. The former wept and the latter were frightened. Jesus, however, received support from above and raised his head, but these cruel men, far from endeavoring to alleviate his sufferings, put the crown of thorns again on his head before they pulled him out of the mud, and no sooner was he once more on his feet than they replaced the cross on his back. The crown of thorns which encircled his head increased his pain inexpressibly and obliged him to bend on one side to give room for the cross, which lay heavily on his shoulders. Chapter 32, The Second Fall of Jesus The afflicted mother of Jesus had left the forum, accompanied by John and some other women, immediately after the unjust sentence was pronounced. She had employed herself in walking to many of the spots sanctified by our Lord and watering them with her tears. But when the sound of the trumpet, the rush of the people, and the clang of the horsemen announced that the procession was about to start for Calvary, she could not resist her longing desire to behold her beloved son once more, and she begged John to take her to some place through which he must pass. John conducted her to a palace which had an entrance in that street which Jesus traversed after his first fall. It was, I believe, the residence of the high priest Caiaphas, whose tribunal was in the division called Sion. John asked and obtained leave from a kind-hearted servant to stand at that entrance mentioned above with Mary and her companions. The mother of God was pale, her eyes were red with weeping, and she was closely wrapped in a cloak of a bluish gray color. The clamor and insulting speeches of the engaged multitude might be plainly heard, and a herald at that moment proclaimed in a loud voice that three criminals were about to be crucified. The servant opened the door, the dreadful sounds became more distinct every moment, and Mary threw herself on her knees. After praying fervently, she turned to John and said, Shall I remain? Ought I to go away? Shall I have strength to support such a sight? John made answer, If you do not remain to see him pass, you will grieve afterwards. He remained, therefore, near the door, with their eyes fixed on the procession, which was still distant, but advancing by slow degrees. When those who were carrying the instruments for the execution approached, and the mother of Jesus saw their insolent and triumphant looks, she could not control her feelings, but joined her hands as if to implore the help of heaven, upon which one among them said to his companions, What woman is that who is uttering such lamentations? Another answered, She is the mother of the Galilean. When the cruel men heard this, far from being moved to compassion, they began to make a game of grief of this most afflicted mother. They pointed at her, and one of them took the nails which were to be used for fastening Jesus to the cross, and presented them to her in an insulting manner. But she turned away, fixed her eyes upon Jesus, who was drawing near, and leant against the pillar for support, lest she should again faint from grief, for her cheeks were as pale as death, and her lips almost blue. The Pharisees on horseback passed by first, followed by the boy who carried the inscription, then came her beloved son. He was almost sinking under the heavy weight of his cross, and his head, 
still crowned with thorns, was drooping in agony on his shoulder. He cast a look of compassion and sorrow upon his mother, and staggered and fell for the second time upon his hands and knees. Mary was perfectly agonized at this sight. She forgot all else. She saw neither soldiers nor executioners. She saw nothing but her dearly beloved son, and springing from the doorway into the midst of the group, who were insulting and abusing him, she threw herself on her knees by his side and embraced him. The only words I heard were, Beloved son, and mother, but I do not know whether these words were really uttered, or whether they were only in my own mind. A momentary confusion ensued. John and the holy women endeavored to raise Mary from the ground, and the archers reproached her, one of them saying, What hast thou to do here, woman? He would not have been in our hands if he had been better brought up. A few of the soldiers looked touched, and although they obliged the Blessed Virgin to retire to the doorway, not one laid hands upon her. John and the women surrounded her as she fell half fainting against a stone, which was near the doorway, and upon which the impression of her hands remained. This stone was very hard, and was afterwards removed to the first Catholic church built in Jerusalem, near the pool of Bethsaida, during the time that St. James the Less was bishop of that city. The two disciples who were with the mother of Jesus carried her into the house, and the door was shut. In the meantime, the archers had raised Jesus and obliged him to carry the cross in a different manner, its arms being unfastened from the center and entangled in the ropes with which he was bound. He supported them on his arm, and by this means the weight of the body of the cross was a little taken off, as it dragged more on the ground. I saw numbers of persons standing about in groups, the greatest part amusing themselves by insulting our Lord in different ways, but a few veiled females were weeping. Chapter 33 Simon of Cyrene Third Fall of Jesus the procession had reached an arch formed in an old wall belonging to the town, opposite to a square, in which three streets terminated, when Jesus stumbled against a large stone which was placed in the middle of the archway. The cross slipped from his shoulder. He fell upon the stone and was totally unable to rise. Many respectable-looking persons who were on their way to the temple stopped and exclaimed compassionately, Look at that poor man! He is certainly dying, but his enemy showed no compassion. This fall caused a fresh delay, as our Lord could not stand up again. And the Pharisees said to the soldiers, We shall never get him to the place of execution alive if you do not find someone to carry his cross. At this moment, Simon of Cyrene, a pagan, happened to pass by, accompanied by his three children. He was a gardener, just returning home after working in a garden near the eastern wall of the city, and carrying a bundle of lapped branches. The soldiers, perceiving by his dress that he was a pagan, seized him and ordered him to assist Jesus in carrying his cross. He refused at first, but was soon compelled to obey, although his children, being frightened, cried and made a great noise, upon which some women quieted and took charge of them. Simon was much annoyed and expressed the greatest vexation at being obliged to walk with a man in so deplorable a condition of dirt and misery. But Jesus wept, and cast such a mild and heavenly look upon him that he was touched, and instead of continuing to show reluctance, helped him to rise, while the executioners fastened one arm of the cross on his shoulders, and he walked behind our Lord, thus relieving him in a great measure from its weight. And when all was arranged, the procession moved forward. Simon was a stout-looking man, apparently about forty years of age. His children were dressed in tunics made of a variegated material. The two eldest, named Rufus and Alexander, afterwards joined the disciples. The third was much younger, but a few years later went to live with St. Stephen. Simon had not carried the cross after Jesus any length of time before he felt his heart deeply touched by grace. Chapter 34 The Veil of Veronica While the procession was passing through a long street, an incident took place which made a strong impression upon Simon. Numbers of respectable persons were hurrying towards the temple, of whom many got out of the way when they saw Jesus. 
from a pharisaical fear of defilement, while others, on the contrary, stopped and expressed pity for his sufferings. But when the procession had advanced about two hundred steps from the spot where Simon began to assist our Lord in carrying his cross, the door of a beautiful house on the left opened, and a woman of majestic appearance, holding a young girl by the hand, came out and walked up to the very head of the procession. Seraphia was the name of the brave woman who thus dared to confront the enraged multitude. She was the wife of Sirach, one of the counselors belonging to the temple, and was afterwards known by the name of Veronica, which name was given from the words Vera Econ, true portrait, to commemorate her brave conduct on this day. Seraphia had prepared some excellent aromatic wine, which he piously intended to present to our Lord to refresh him on his dolorous way to Calvary. She had been standing in the street for some time, and at last went back into the house to wait. He was, when I first saw her, enveloped in a long veil, and holding a little girl of nine years of age, whom she had adopted by the hand. A large veil was likewise hanging on her arm, and the little girl endeavored to hide the jar of wine when the procession approached. Those who were marching at the head of the procession tried to push her back, but she made her way through the mob, the soldiers and the archers, reached Jesus, fell on her knees before him, and presented the veil, saying at the same time, Permit me to wipe the face of my Lord. Jesus took the veil in his left hand, wiped his bleeding face, and returned it with thanks. Seraphia kissed it and put it under her cloak. The girl then timidly offered the wine, but the brutal soldiers would not allow Jesus to drink it. The suddenness of this courageous act of Seraphia had surprised the guards and caused a momentary, although unintentional, halt, of which he had taken advantage to present the veil to her divine master. Both the Pharisees and the guards were greatly exasperated, not only by the sudden halt, but much more by the public testimony and veneration which was thus paid to Jesus. And they revenged themselves by striking and abusing him, while Seraphia returned in haste to her house. No sooner did she reach her room than she placed the woolen veil on a table and fell almost senseless on her knees. A friend who entered the room a short time after found her thus kneeling, with the child weeping by her side, and saw, to his astonishment, the bloody countenance of our Lord imprinted upon the veil, a perfect likeness, although heart-rending and painful to look upon. He roused Seraphia and pointed to the veil. She again knelt down before it, and exclaimed through her tears, Now I shall indeed leave all with a happy heart, for my Lord has given me a remembrance of himself. The texture of this veil was a species of very fine wool. It was three times the length of its width, and was generally worn on the shoulders. It was customary to present these veils to persons who were in affliction, or over-fatigued, or ill, that they may wipe their faces with them, and it was done in order to express sympathy or compassion. Veronica kept this veil until her death, and hung it at the head of her bed. It was then given to the Blessed Virgin, who left it to the Apostles, and they afterwards passed it on to the Church. Seraphia and John the Baptist were cousins, her father and Zacharias being brothers. When Joachim and Anna brought the Blessed Virgin, who was then only four years old, up to Jerusalem, to place her among the virgins in the temple, they lodged in the house of Zacharias, which was situated near the fish market. Seraphia was at least five years older than the Blessed Virgin, was present at her marriage with St. Joseph, and was likewise related to the aged Simeon, who prophesied when the child Jesus was put into his arms. She was brought up with his sons, both of whom, as well as Seraphia, he imbued with his ardent desire of seeing our Lord. When Jesus was twelve years old and remained teaching in the temple, Seraphia, who was not then married, sent food for him every day to a little inn a quarter of a mile from Jerusalem, where he dwelt when he was not in the temple. Mary went there for two days, when on her way from Bethlehem to Jerusalem to offer her child in the temple. The two old men who kept this inn were Essenians and well acquainted with the Holy Family. It contained a kind of foundation for the poor, and Jesus and his disciples often went there for a night's lodging. 
Seraphia married rather late in life. Her husband, Sirach, was descended from the chaste Susanna, and was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was at first greatly opposed to our Lord, and his wife suffered much on account of her attachment to Jesus and to the holy women. But Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus brought him to a better state of feeling, and he allowed Seraphia to follow our Lord. When Jesus was unjustly accused in the court of Caiaphas, the husband of Seraphia joined with Joseph and Nicodemus in attempts to obtain the liberation of our Lord, and all three resigned their seats in the council. Seraphia was about fifty at the time of the triumphant procession of our Lord when he entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and I then saw her take off her veil and spread it on the ground for him to walk upon. It was this same veil which he presented to Jesus at this his second procession, a procession which outwardly appeared to be far less glorious, but was in fact much more so. This veil obtained for her the name of Veronica, and it is still known for the veneration of the faithful. Chapter 35 The Fourth and Fifth Falls of Jesus The Daughters of Jerusalem The procession was still at some distance from the southwest gate, which was large and attached to the fortifications, and the street was rough and steep. It had first to pass under a vaulted arch, then over a bridge, and finally under a second arch. The wall on the left side of the gate runs first in a southerly direction, then deviates a little to the west, and finally runs to the south behind Mount Sion. When the procession was near this gate, the brutal archers shoved Jesus into a stagnant pool, which was close to it. Simon of Cyrene, in his endeavors to avoid the pool, gave the cross a twist, which caused Jesus to fall down for the fourth time in the midst of the dirty mud, and Simon had the greatest difficulty in lifting up the cross again. Jesus then exclaimed in a tone which, although clear, was moving and sad, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered together thy children, as the hen doth gather her chickens under her wings, and thou wouldst not. When the Pharisees heard these words, they became still more angry, and, recommencing their insults and blows, endeavoring to force him to get up out of the mud, their cruelty to Jesus so exasperated Simon of Cyrene that he at last exclaimed, If you continue this brutal conduct, I will throw down the cross and carry it no farther. I will do so if you kill me for it. A narrow and stony path was visible as soon as the gate was passed, and this path ran in a northerly direction and led to Calvary. The high road from which it deviates divided shortly after into three branches, one to the southwest which led to Bethlehem, through the Vale of Gihon, a second to the south towards Emmaus and Joppa, a third, likewise, to the southwest, wound round Calvary, and terminated at the gate which led to Bethsar. A person standing at the gate through which Jesus was led might easily see the gate of Bethlehem. The officers had fastened an inscription upon a post which stood at the commencement of the road to Calvary to inform those who passed by that Jesus and the two thieves were condemned to death. A group of women had gathered together near the spot and were weeping and lamenting. Many carried young children in their arms. The greatest part were young maidens and women from Jerusalem, who had preceded the procession, but a few came from Bethlehem, from Hebron, and from other neighboring places, in order to celebrate the Pasch. Jesus was on the point of again falling, but Simon, who was behind, perceiving that he could not stand, hastened to support him. He leant upon Simon, and was thus saved from falling to the ground. When the women and children of whom we have spoken above saw the deplorable condition to which our Lord was reduced, they utterly cried loud cries, wept, and according to the Jewish custom, presented him clothes to wipe his face. Jesus turned towards them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not over me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the day shall come wherein they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not borne, 
and the paps that have never given suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall upon us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if in the green wood they do these things, what shall be done in the dry? And he then addressed a few words of consolation to them, which I do not exactly remember. The procession made a momentary halt. The executioners, who set off first, had reached Calvary with the instruments for the execution, and were followed by a hundred of the Roman soldiers who had started with Pilate. He only accompanied the processions as far as the gateway, and returned to the town. Chapter 36 Jesus on Mount Golgotha, Sixth and Seventh Falls of Jesus The procession again moved on. The road was very steep and rough between the walls of the town and Calvary, and Jesus had the greatest difficulty in walking with his heavy burden on his shoulders, but his cruel enemies, far from feeling the slightest compassion or giving the least assistance, continued to urge him on by the infliction of hard blows and the utterance of dreadful curses. At last they reached a spot where the pathway turned suddenly to the south. Here he stumbled and fell for the sixth time. The fall was a dreadful one, but the guards only struck him the harder to force him to get up, and no sooner did he reach Calvary than he sank down again for the seventh time. Simon of Cyrene was filled with indignation and pity, notwithstanding his fatigue. He wished to remain that he might assist Jesus, but the archers first reviled and then drove him away, and he soon after joined the body of disciples. The executioners then ordered the workmen and the boys who had carried the instruments for the execution to depart, and the Pharisees soon arrived, for they were on horseback and had taken the smooth and easy road which ran to the east of Calvary. There was a fine view of the whole town of Jerusalem from the top of Calvary. This top was circular, and about the size of an ordinary riding school, surrounded by a low wall and with five separate entrances. This appeared to be the usual number in those parts, for there were five roads at the baths, at the place where they baptized, at the pool of Bethsaida, and there were likewise many towns with five gates. In this, as in many other peculiarities of the Holy Land, there was a deep prophetic signification that number five, which so often occurred, was a type of those five sacred wounds of our blessed Savior, which were to open to us the gates of heaven. The horsemen stopped on the west side of the mount, where the declivity was not so steep, for the side up which the criminals were brought was both rough and steep. About a hundred soldiers were stationed on different parts of the mountain, and as space was required, the thieves were not brought to the top, but ordered to halt before they reached it, and to lie on the ground with their arms fastened to their crosses. Soldiers stood around and guarded them, while crowds of persons who did not fear defiling themselves stood near the platform or on the neighboring heights. These were mostly of the lower classes, strangers, slaves, and pagans, and a number of them were women. It was about a quarter to twelve when Jesus, loaded with his cross, sank down at the precise spot where he was to be crucified. The barbarous executioners dragged him up by the cords which they had fastened around his waist, and then untied the arms of the cross and threw them on the ground. 
the sight of our blessed Lord at this moment was, indeed, calculated to move the hardest heart to compassion. He stood, or rather bent over the cross, being scarcely able to support himself. His heavenly countenance was pale, and was as that of a person on the verge of death, although wounds and blood disfigured it to a frightful degree. But the hearts of these cruel men were, alas, harder than iron itself, and far from showing the slightest commiseration, they threw him brutally down, exclaiming in a jeering tone, Most powerful king, we are about to prepare thy throne. Jesus immediately placed himself upon the cross, and they measured him and marked the places for his feet and hands, whilst the Pharisees continued to insult their unresisting victim. When the measurement was finished, they led him to a cave cut in the rock, which had been used formerly as a cellar, opened the door, and pushed him in so roughly that had it not been for the support of angels, his legs must have been broken by so hard a fall on the rough stone floor. I most distinctly heard his groans of pain, but they closed the door quickly and placed guards before it, and the archers continued their preparations for the crucifixion. The center of the platform mentioned above was the most elevated part of Calvary. It was a round eminence, about two feet high, and persons were obliged to ascend two or three steps to reach its top. The executioners dug the holes for the three crosses at the top of this eminence, and placed those intended for the thieves, one on the right and the other on the left of our lords. Both were lower and more roughly made than his. They then carried the cross of our Savior to the spot where they intended to crucify him, and placed it in such a position that it would easily fall into the hole prepared for it. They fastened the two arms strongly onto the body of the cross, nailed the board at the bottom, which was to support the feet, bored the holes for the nails, and cut different hollows in the wood and the parts which would receive the head and back of our Lord, in order that his body might rest against the cross, instead of being suspended from it. Their aim in this was the prolongation of his tortures, for if the whole weight of his body was allowed to fall upon the hands, the holes might be quite torn open, and death ensue more speedily than they desired. The executioners then drove into the ground the pieces of wood which were intended to keep the cross upright, and made a few other similar preparations. Welcome to the Virgo Potens YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, give it a like. I also invite you to subscribe to this channel so that you won't miss new content. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by becoming a patron of Virgo Potens on Patreon and or by buying one of my books. My ebooks are available on Amazon as well as on the Apple Bookstore. For those who prefer a physical copy rather than an ebook, my book Spiritual Warfare Know Thy Enemy is also available as a paperback on Amazon. If you are interested in making a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by simply buying one of my books. I am thankful for your support. Links to Patreon and to my books will be posted in the comments section of this video. The continuation of this work isn't possible without you. Lastly, and most importantly, please pray for me. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Thank <laughs> you.